Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to have a nice discussion today about um, machine learning and AI tools and how you can implement and use them inside of your team to help drive uh, support and customer service more efficiently, more accurately, uh, in a better way for your customers, basically. And so joining me on stage, I have uh, some very wonderful people. So I'll let each of them introduce themselves, basically who you are, uh, what company you're from, what you're looking after in your business, and maybe um, like what's one thing you're really excited by these days? <coughs> Mike, if you want to start. Sure. Uh, so my name is Mike Yakulov. I'm the manager of technology alliances at Zendesk. Um, Zendesk creates software that allows businesses to communicate with their customers better, and I work on the apps marketplace, which allows Zenist to be tailored to every individual customer's needs. Um, I identify specific categories of where partners and um, sort of apps can contribute to customer's lifecycle. Um, and what I'm really interested in and very excited about um, is the future of automation and how it impacts the customer experience, the agent experience, as well as the admin experience. Um, we've invested a lot on our own, and uh, very excited to see what comes of it. Just so I have an, uh, an understanding, are there any Zendesk users in the, in the audience today? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> right on. Very good. Cool. Thank you, Mike. And Bree? Cool. Hi, y'all. I'm Bree. I work with Magoosh. We're a test prep company. We help students prepare for like the GRE, GMAT, LSAT. Um, and I lead a team of 12 who are working with uh, some really stressed out students and really wowing them with their responses. Um, and one thing that I'm super excited about right now is and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more, but um, I'm fully automating some tickets with uh, Digital Genius, and that we just launched yesterday, so I'm like anxiously looking every like uh, every hour to make sure everything's been automated correctly, and so far it's been, yeah, it's been really great. And James? Hey, I'm James Lemire, uh, the Director of Customer Care at Soylent. Um, Soylent is a, a line of meal replacement beverages uh, co complete meal replacement beverages. Um, we're in Los Angeles. And a couple things that I'm excited about. Uh, one, we have a new flavor coming out uh, next week. So, yeah, strawberry. So, um, excited about that. And another thing I'm uh, excited about is that uh, we've been doing a, a trial um, with some, some cancer patients who have uh, neck and throat cancer. Um, and through our, uh, you know, using Soylent, um, they've been able to, a significant majority of the patients did not need a feeding tube. Um, and, and they had a, a you know, in, <laughs> better standard of living while they're going through treatment. So, um, yeah, that's still in process, but promising. And so I'm excited about that. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. So, who here has tried Soylent before? Yeah, yeah, very nice. good. So I'm very grateful to James and his company because it keeps a lot of my team basically fed when we're working either late into the night or like missing lunches. And it's just like an awesome product to try if you haven't tried it already. Um, and you have many flavors now with strawberry coming up. So it should be fun. So um, Mike, since you're here representing Zendesk, um, you have a program at Zendesk which is called the Technology Alliances Program. And um, it allows companies like yours and companies like ours to work together to help customers. Can you tell us about the Technology Alliances program, what it's for, what it's about, and how it can be helpful to the people here? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think one of the main functions of my team and what we do is to make the lives of our customers easier um, and make, make it easier for them to engage with their customers. Um, Zendesk is a great platform for you to be able to do that, but like I mentioned, you need to have Zendesk be customizable for specific use cases. Not every business is going to be B2C or B2B. Um, and so one of the reasons why we have a technology alliances program is to identify specific categories where our customers are looking for something that we don't offer in-house mm -hmm. uh, and partner with companies that contribute to our story and make the lives of our customers easier. And what, what are some of the categories of the tech alliances? And obviously machine learning is one of them. That's what we're talking about here. Can you tell us why like, AI is an important category that you guys have looked after? Yeah, I mean, we've invested in AI and machine learning capabilities and functionality on our own. Um, and we rely on some of our partners' expertise who solely focus on AI and machine learning in order to provide those customer experiences to their customers. Um, has anyone in the room ever done a password reset ticket? <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> has anyone ever seen a majority of their inbound volume be password reset tickets? <laughs> How many of you would never like to do a password reset ticket again? <laughs> AI and machine learning allows you to do that, right? Like, these are repetitive tickets that typically respond to either with a macro or whatever, but so much time is spent on doing these repetitive tasks that don't need to be sort of done, right? Mm -hmm. And so with automation, it's really exciting to see what 
can be possible, um, which is why we have other panelists who uh, you know, have experience with hands-on digital genius magic. So these are practitioners you know, in the industry using machine learning tools today. Before we get to you guys, um, I want to just give you my view of like how to look at machine learning in the context of your support org. The way I look at it is there's three specific types of use cases you can go after using ML tools. And I use ML and AI kind of interchangeably during this discussion. Uh, the first one is a basic classification uh, use case. So for all the tickets you have coming in, um, if you have yourself or your team members manually tagging or classifying or you know, using drop-down menus to route those tickets and, and properly classify them, those are tasks that are costing you time and clicks and they're quite repetitive. And so machine learning tools provided enough data can be very effective, very accurate at actually pre-filling all of the metadata like tags, like drop-down menus, like classifications so that you don't have to spend your time doing it. And one example of this is one of our customers, KLM, in the last few months has saved over five million clicks for their agents who no longer have to click around their Salesforce instance and label incoming emails manually. And so when you think about a click, is that, what is that, a second? Half a second? No, actually, if it's a drop-down menu, it's a click to open the drop-down menu and you've got a list of 20 things, maybe in alphabet alphabetical order if you're lucky, and you choose one and then you move on. So it's a couple clicks, couple seconds, it takes time. So that's the first use case, is automated meta tagging, classification. The second one, which we'll hear about later today, is actually recommending answers to your support team. So whenever emails or chats are coming in, well, your contact center representative or agent or team member can read that, and, they, and the machine learning should recommend them an answer. You know, what is a good answer to provide in this particular scenario? And then the agent has control of approving, personalizing, or ignoring that recommended answer if they don't agree with it, and the machine should be learning from that. So that's the second use case that we've seen work really well. And the third use case is being able to automate not just the questions. If the confidence score of the recommendation is high enough, you can automate the question back as an answer to the customer, but actually driving end-to-end -end resolution. And I think this is what Bree mentioned just a few minutes ago, is being able to take a chunk, a category of your repetitive tickets that are not as simple as a question and an answer, but actually involve some back-end system, a data lookup, checking eligibility of the customer for a refund, for example, and being able to drive that entire process completely autonomously so that you don't have to spend any time doing it yourself. So those are the three basic categories that we've explored and have built products to support. And so you'll hear about some of them today. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk about just the, the org as a whole. What are some of the challenges, Bree, that, um, challenges and opportunities that you experienced um, in your support organization uh, prior to trying any machine learning tools? This is going back you're, you're a pioneer, yeah. you've been using Digital Genius for a year and a half, almost two years now. So tell us, you know, what were some of the challenges and things that led you to look in this direction? Yeah, um, it's kind of laughable now at yeah. this point what our pain point was then. Uh, so we have been, Magician's been around for about nine years. Um, at that point, we weren't getting any questions that we hadn't seen before. So we know that there's a ton of stellar responses in our system. How do we pull those responses to serve to our our agents and so um, we built out a ton of macros I'm kind of embarrassed and impressed also to say that we have about a thousand macros um, and uh, yeah we were seeing this gap between the resources we had available and connecting those to our agents um, so initially what we were looking for was a way to surface those macros um, and so uh, we use Zendesk if you use Zendesk you know that if you don't type in exactly the right title like you're not gonna find that macro and there's something more frustrating than that. Uh, so we, we kind of looked into some um, options that would help us better surface macros. And then we found out that there's technology to not only like help you search for macros, but also recommend macros, um, which was a pain point we didn't realize we had. So um, yeah, I think that that was the initial start of it. That was the initial pain point that led us to, to search or look into AI. Very good. And uh, James, in your world, so you're a more recent Digital Genius customer and partner, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you were experiencing or foreseeing as, as Soylent grew uh, that made you look in the direction of machine learning tools? Yes, so uh, when we started looking for different machine learning tools, things were actually going pretty well, so it was more of a proactive approach. Um, uh, I suppose one of the challenges that we had was that we only had one we only had one support channel 
Uh, that was the email. Um, yeah, so so we realized we're, we're we're definitely missing out on some consumers who want to contact us, but maybe we don't have their preferred method. So uh, I guess one of the goals that we had was how can we keep costs relatively flat um, or you know reasonably low uh, while we add on more features and so try not to increase headcount. Um, so it was more of a we we the effort was to not increase headcount. That was the goal, and also with the time saved. Um, Essentially, we also wanted to create a, a, a growth path for our agents. So uh, my, my team is in the Philippines, and um, we want to cultivate their growth even though they're on the other side of the world. So it's kind of like those two things. How can we expand the features on our program and also cultivate more experienced agents? Awesome. That makes sense. Very good. Okay, and then Mike, for you, since you see so many different customers, uh, you know, being a part of Zendesk, uh, I'm sure you get requests for machine learning functionality tools or just questions about it in general. Are you hearing some of the same things from your customers that are coming to you for machine learning solutions? Not immediately, because mm -hmm. when someone says, we need machine learning in AI, they typically don't know what that means. They just It's a buzzword and it's a phrase yeah. that they're like, oh, it's gonna solve all my problems, cool, I need it. Um, <laughs> without really digging too deep into what the underlying issue is, right? Like, is it time spent on ticket? Is it the amount of tickets that you're actually getting? Um, it could be a number of these different things. So it's kind of challenging to expect customers to know what they want because there's so many different options out there and that's such a huge investment to put into just research about something that you really don't know what you're trying to solve for. Right? Yeah. Um, so about the, the, the main thing that we really see the most success in is when we do proper discovery on a call mm -hmm. um, to understand like what is your underlying core problem. And then once you identify that, you drill down a little bit further and you basically say, cool, ticket deflection, that's what you're really trying to do. Yeah. There's an AI and machine learning partner for that. Um, if you're trying to automate backend processes through machine learning, there's a pro partner for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that, that underlying reason is super important. It's interesting, so I think one lesson that I learned personally, and I've, I've been building this company since day one for now three and a half years, is that AI is not a magic bullet. It's not one of those things like click, you get it, and it just like, all sorts of wonderful things happen and right. you never have to think about customer support ever again. I think of it as a tool that supports you and your team in performing um, at, a, at, a, at a better, faster pace um, and delivering upon your customers' expectations. So while there are many different use cases and problems and challenges you may be looking to solve in your organization, I think we look at it as two things. One is the customer expectations that are constantly growing within your customer or user base. They want you to be available in multiple languages, on channels that they like to use. Uh, they want you to be available 24 seven. Sometimes they don't even want you involved because they want to help themselves. So the customer's expectations is always rising. And in competitive industries, you know, customer service has really become a differentiator because it's hard to compete on product, it's hard to compete on price. And after a while, the best thing you have really to leverage is the level of service that you can provide. So it, in no universe does it make sense not to provide your support team with the right tools so they can provide the best service. And so that's where I think machine learning comes in play, is becoming that calculator in a world where people can only do mental math today. It's the, you know, a, an accountant would never be expected to do their job without a calculator. A banker would never, an analyst would never do their job without an Excel spreadsheet. Similar to this, we believe that customer service industry is going through a transformation and people on the ground are seeking the right tools to help themselves uh, perform faster, better, and frankly, just be more focused on the things that require a lot of the human level of intelligence and, and, and dialogue than you know, tagging tickets or uh, you know, searching for macros, basically. So, Mike, you touched on an interesting concept, which is that where do you even begin to research? Yeah. And uh, we've been in the space now for three and a half years. Um, and over the course of the last three and a half years, AI has become like literally the buzziest buzzword of it all. And, like, what does it all mean? AI, machine learning, chatbots. Like, where does one begin and the other end? Who knows, right? So um, I wanted to ask you guys, because uh, prior to working with Digital Genius, some of you worked with other providers, and uh, maybe you've done a lot of research. So how did you go about uh, basically choosing and researching for the right AI partner? Maybe Brie? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, if we work with students who are really stressed out. Um, so we don't want to discourage them from reaching out to us, so that kind of ruled out deflection pretty early on. Um, we actually, 
we were interested in Digital Genius, but at that time, uh, y'all were only working with Salesforce. That's right. Um, and so we turned to wise.io. Um, we were working with them for a little bit, and they got acquired. We didn't know where that was going to lead. A little scary kind of going with a company where we don't know which direction they're going. So, um, yeah, we kind of looked elsewhere, and we're excited about the things that Digital Genius is doing. Awesome. Thank you. And James, what about you? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'd worked with, uh, I, well, really, I beta tested with another AI group uh, before. Um, that didn't go well because we ended up having to do a lot of work. So, not that <laughs> I'm averse to doing work, but if I'm paying for it, I do yeah. a little bit more. Um, yeah, so it had to, had to be actually be accurate and effective. So it was nice I could talk to Bree, and she'd be like, yes, this actually, this actually works. Um, so unless you have that, you have to figure it out doing it by trial. Um, and then we also, we wanted to find uh, a partner who was focused on, also on the agent and not necessarily excluding the agent from the process because there were a lot of other partners that um, I found who, potential partners who, uh, there were some who were way on the other end of the spectrum who were like, yes, like it's, you know, singularity is coming, like forget the agents. And that was really, those were some really bizarre conversations because <laughs> um, they were serious. But, uh, so, so yeah, we wanted to find the partner who, who, who essentially could meet in the middle and empower the agents. Uh, and then uh, third, I think there's another, oh, you had to have either imminently or, or on the horizon th those back-end functions, doing the things like uh, categorizing and then hooking, hooking it up behind the scenes, so that had to be on the horizon. So you had actually like specifically three criteria you were looking to fulfill, and you were beta, beta testing some teams that you, know, you learned that it did or didn't work, you know, ultimately, so do you recommend that to the folks in the room? Like, if they're evaluating a, a, a machine learning opportunity, is to actually make a list of the things that are really important to them? And yeah, that's what helped me. That. I decided if I, I was going to do this, um, I want to know exactly what I want to get out of it. So those are the three things I came up with. That's I, awesome. I found it helpful. Yeah. And the other thing I heard you say was getting a reference from another another user, another customer from Bree was actually helpful because you could hear from her perspective how the whole implementation and process worked. Yeah, definitely. Because with, with the, the first ones that I had tried, it, I wasn't able to speak with anybody else. It was yeah. I was like the first one going in. Yeah. So I was kind of disenchanted by the time, yeah. Um, you know, I came around again. So it was helpful to talk to Bree, and she was like, "Yes, you know, it works." Got it. So, so um, I want to double click on the human element because you brought that up, and that's really important. We three and a half years ago started, believe it or not, as a chatbot company. So like when we first built our first platform. It was a chatbot builder that you can script a bot without writing any code, and we deployed the first chatbots to enterprise companies like Coca-Cola, BMW, Panasonic, and a bunch of others. And about six to nine months into that process, we kind of hit a ceiling, and we realized how limiting the chatbot functionalities really are. And so, and then about a year and a half after, there's this huge hype cycle of chatbots becoming like the new cool thing with everybody talking about them, big companies kind of building their own chatbots, and then. If you haven't seen it already, the chatbot is kind of starting to dip again. And so we kind of got ahead of that and realized that anything that requires upfront scripting, aka work on behalf of, for the customer to do themselves, like scripting a bot, can you imagine in trying to invent every single phrase that your customer could possibly ask you? In the support world, we know that's not the way customers speak to us. They'll tell you their life story, and somewhere in the middle will be like, I need a refund. <laughs> and so how do you script for that, right? And that's where machine learning and deep learning specifically um, has caught up as a technology. So how does the tech actually work? We take historical logs, so email transcripts, chat logs, social media posts with questions and answers, and we ingest them into a deep learning algorithm. And what that means basically is that we're converting the language into these mathematical representation of language called word vectors, and we're using those vectors to train the, the AI model in the cloud. And so at the end of the day, you have this thing that has just ingested, you know, 100,000, 200,000, half a million, or for smaller customers, just 2,000 conversations, and has learned what is the correct correlation between questions and answers, historically in your business, which is very different from the business next to you and the, and the person next to you. So uh, that's why deep learning is much more effective than, let's say, scripting a bot, is because instead of sitting there and trying to invent every way that your customer asks you a question, it actually comes from your own historical logs, real conversations that already happened between your support team and your customers. And so from there, once you have the model, you have to start figuring out how do you actually provide value? And how does it like either help your team be more effective? How does it unlock time to do more interesting things? 
And we at Digital Genius came up with two solutions or two applications. The first one is called Copilot, and Copilot mode is basically uh, what Bree was talking about initially, which is that it provides recommended answers or macros to the users, to the agents, so that they can approve or personalize them on the fly instead of searching for macros or typing answers or copy pasting out of other systems. So that's Copilot, and it's all about empowering the agents to be faster and more effective and not waste time on sort of like the clicking around stuff. The second mode that we built is called Autopilot. And Autopilot is about end-to-end -end case resolution. So for common tickets like refunds, subscriptions, upgrades. Password resets. Password resets. <laughs> things that require a back-end system lookup and action. Machine learning should not only use the AI engine to understand the conversation, but slide that conversation into a sequence of back-end processes that will solve that ticket end-to-end. -end. And with that, we're seeing some really great results early. We just launched this a little bit earlier uh, a month ago. And so, Bree, you guys turned this on actually last night. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about that. So, you know, what made you want to try that out? And uh, I think we have some numbers from earlier today which we can share. Right. So. Uh, so we have a high volume number of tickets um, that are essentially the password resets of, you know, there's 10 to 20 percent of our tickets that are these like no brainers. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll give you an extension. Yes, we'll give you a refund. Um, but there is we can automate the, the response, but someone on the back end has to, or there has to be a human touch to actually make that happen. And so, yeah, this has been a long time, long time coming, um, but we turn on, turned on an automation for extensions. Um, students write in, they immediately get a response back, and their account has been extended. And just imagine on the student's end, where you know they have a couple more days until their, their exam, their, or their subscription's about to expire, like help, I need help right away. Um, and to get that response right away is, I'm sure, incredible on their end. Yeah, so, um, and, and James, you mentioned that that was really an important thing for you from the onset, is finding a partner that could, at some point, provide the back-end integrations to drive those resolutions. Like, why was that a no-brainer? Why was that important to you? Well, because it accounted for at least 80% of our volume require some sort of back-end function. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just even like little things, just like, what's my tracking number? It's like all Because that's not in Zendesk. Push. That's sitting in a back-end system that you have, like a Shopify or like your homegrown system. Right, right. We have, we have a custom, we have a custom system. So it was, yeah. it was almost, yeah, so it was about, it was about 80%. So I figured if we're going to do this, um, we, we need that capability eventually. It. Awesome. So one of the ideas is to get rid of that swivel chair experience where you're sitting inside one console and then just to solve this question you have to go to another system and another system, perform some actions, copy paste stuff back and forth between different screens and you can actually do this. And like not every machine learning company is going to do that for you because most AI stuff today it's all about question answering, right? You know, just here's a question, here's an answer. We want to go beyond that and provide that end-to-end -end resolution that the customer is actually looking for. And so uh, at Magush, you turned this on just last night, and I think t to date you have now auto resolved almost, I think it's like tw at least 20, 20 tickets were completely solved um, without student waiting for any, in any queue, right? And uh, with another customer that we have uh, since we launched this, this functionality, they're now auto resolving 30% of their ticket volume um, every single day, every single week, and they're now going on their second or third month. So. Uh, that's a pretty powerful thing. And by the way, that's just one topic that has to do with the refunds. And so if you're getting you know, different topics like that and you feel like you need to put that on autopilot, this is the right way to do This is a way to do that. Okay, so Mike, one more question for you related to the partner line, the Tech Alliances program. Uh, what do you look for in a machine learning partner to be able to bring them into your program and actually recommend them to your customers? Uh, for me, the most important thing is they're stance on customer service, right? Like my bottom line is to make sure that all of Zenda's customers are treated with the highest level of customer service uh, because we have to eat what we preach, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a phrase somewhere in there, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, we, we are firm believers in that customer service is, and the customer experience is super critical to retaining customers, making sure customers are happy. And so a partner needs to have that same level of commitment. Um, and so we, there were some partners that we were looking at that you know had a great solution, but they would reach back out to us once a week after we would send emails, and they wouldn't mm. be engaging. Um, 
if that's the way that they're engaging with us, they're probably going to be engaging with our customers in a similar fashion, which ultimately looks bad on Zendesk. Um, so we wanted to find partners that were aligned to our vision and values of customer experience, of agent experience, uh, and all things Zendesk. So. So, so, so the phrase you're looking for is that we gotta drink the soy land. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's the one. That, can't believe I forgot that one, so sorry. So, so we're, yep, I'm drinking the soil, that's for sure. So um, let's talk about like the, your team. You know, since you got Digital Genius, and since James, you got Digital Genius, what have been some of the feedback, like good and bad, please, and um, you know, and, like, how are they liking it? Oh, good. Hmm? Um, so implementation was like really seamless, so it's really easy um, for Magoosh. Um, the nice thing that we had was, you know, we obviously have a Slack channel, um, and if any of our agents had any questions, there's actual digital genius folks in the Slack channel, um, instead of them having to go through me to someone else. And um, So yeah, I think like, while there were very few questions that came through that, uh, just like the accessibility <coughs> there was really nice for my team. Um, yeah, I think like, it, we just hired um, a few new folks, and the, I just have full confidence in like, you know, if if they get stuck, there is a tool there to support them, um, and I, I think that they also feel that as well. Is like, yes, there is a tool that like that is their first line to go to. Of course, we have other other forms of support as well, but um, yeah, I feel like we are able to get them into supporting our students much more quickly than we have in the past. So, for example, for new agents, new hires, instead of them going straight to a mentor and maybe distracting somebody from their work, they have the tool there that's recommending answers that they know have a certain confidence level, so that they can feel comfortable, you know, replying with that answer and maybe personalizing it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Cool. What about you, James? What uh, was there any change management involved? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when we first implemented the tool, it was fairly, fairly seamless as well. Um, we. We, so we did some training sessions and we polled the agents and asked them open-ended questions. Um, you know, what could be better? What is it missing? And really, we didn't, we didn't get too much, um, too much back from that. They seemed to really enjoy it and uh, it, it worked for them. Um, and we also found out that a lot of the agents, most of them had, were, were using macros that on like notepads off to the side that like weren't in Zendesk. So that was really helpful. Like we knew it was going on, and then we were just figure out figure out who, who was doing it, um, and kind of like fold everything into the same channel. Um, and then the third thing, so we we left an open ended question on the on the poll, um, but the third thing I, th I thought was interesting was that a lot of the agents were asking uh, essentially, is this um, my training my replacement? So it, yeah. it kind of uh, it, yeah, it kind of made them nervous for a bit. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, we had to we had we had to manage that a little bit, um, and so essentially, I've, I explained to them. I, I had to we had to go into greater detail about what our plans were and what the trajectory what uh, what trajectory we wanted to take and how we wanted to add new levels of uh, new channels of support and new features. And since the implementation and uh, automation process was somewhat gradual. Um, Th there haven't been any problems with like morale or turnover or anything, and that's something we, we pull for as well. Yeah. So I, I think that it, it's, um, it incentivized, so, so it somewhat incentivized their, their usage of the tool once we um, let them know how they were gonna grow and not how they were going to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's a very good point. Um, in the early days especially, we would get a lot of this first question, like, oh my God, am I gonna lose my job? Like, is this AI thing gonna just take over the whole contact center? And inevitably, like that's usually, people jump to that, and the reason for that is because Hollywood. I mean, you come from LA, and so all the movies in the last like two years have had some kind of ex machina twist to them. And so if people are watching, like what is AI, you know, whether it's Black Mirror, Westworld, ex machina, <laughs> transcendence, I mean, let's keep going here. It's like, what's gonna happen to us? And uh, for us, like, being in the, in the science of machine learning, in the actual like programming of it, you realize that we're nowhere near the level of artificial general intelligence that's being portrayed inside these movies. Like that's not what this is about. This is like about giving the calculator to the people that need it the most at the right time. And so I think for agent morale, it's really important, what I took away from your comment, James, is to be transparent about what are your goals with machine learning what is it there to do in the near term, in the medium term, and in the long term? 
and things will change over time and then the team has to adjust to that and hopefully it opens up new opportunities for them to progress their career inside of the customer service industry. So to that point, what are some things that your agent's doing now that uh, maybe they didn't have time to do before or as leaders of your teams, like how are you thinking about you know, repositioning them in ways that are probably more fulfilling for them? Yeah, this is something that I feel like is a little bit more unique with Magoosh. Um, we have, in the past, we've only done, or my team has only done customer support, um, and we are now touching every other department in some way. Um, so essentially, our team is really great at communicating with students, and so we have been reaching out to other departments and saying like, hey, what can we do to support you and your projects um, in communicating with students? Uh, so it, it like not only has been really great for Magoosh uh, for as a company um, being able to have these like advocates who are really great at communicating with our customers, um, but also I think to James' point earlier of like this development for our support agents, it's like what what else can we add? How can we how can they become more uh, like multi layered? Um, so it's been kind of a nice little um, yeah win win. Nice. What about you, James, and your team? Um, what's, the, what's the question? So basically, um, with the time you've unlocked yeah. using machine learning tools like Digital Genius, what are new other things that your team is now get a chance to do? Right, right. So, so with <clears throat> some of the initial time savings. Um, so, like for some of the stuff that we've been able to automate. So we've been automating for you know just a slice right now. Um, but for so we're testing some things out on smaller scale, and one of them is. Um, agents who would have been solving that specific subcategory of tickets, it, now that they're automated, we're having those agents be QA inspectors for those tickets. So, <clears throat> which frees up some of their mental bandwidth to be able to view the interaction objectively rather than viewing their own work and wondering how they could have done it better. So instead of them doing the work, they're looking at the, the AI's work and figuring out how we can improve the, the communication and look for more opportunities. Um, so that's one, and then the, so, so with some of the other time savings, we're able to um, <clears throat> do some things like we've been um, um, pull, so some of our agents we've been able to pull information um, from Amazon reviews and synthesize the Amazon reviews and break them down in different categories and um, share those with product development and marketing. Um, so, so those are a couple things. So basically, saving the time allows you to uh, provide exposure for your team members to do things that would create additional value for the business. Yes. Things they would have probably never had a chance to even try their hand at, like QA or you know, like looking at Amazon reviews and synthesizing them. Right, and, and the QA also has a, has a ripple effect that goes upward, so the, the team leads or subject matter experts now have a little bit more time as well, and so they can focus their time doing other things, so it's kind of, it's kind of creating that impact on the way up as well. Nice, nice, that makes sense. Very cool. One other example I've heard of uh, what teams have done, we have an online travel agency that, that has been using um, the technology, and so they've reduced their average handling time by about 30%, and so across the volume, it, it actually saves a lot of time, and so they've, they've retrained some of their agents to be able to do upselling and cross-selling of travel, and so they're finding ways to turn upset travelers into like vacationers, like happy vacationers, and driving revenues for their business. And so in this particular case, this company called Travelbird, they've now turned their contact center profitable. And in a world where like a, co a contact center operation is normally a cost center for the business, and it's always perceived as that, it's more frequently perceived as a cost center, if you can find ways you know, to, to communicate up saying, no, we're not just costing this company money, we are creating, number one, we are the, first line of com communication between this business and our customers and we have a chance not just to like solve their challenges but also create value for them and for the business. So it's starting to open up the discussion to some more broader um, opportunities for these agents and for these team members, which we find is, is pretty cool. Cool. Okay, so Mike, um, you have a view um, on a lot of partners, not just AI and machine learning partners. So for the folks here, what are some of the tools and uh, technology lines as partners that you've seen that can actually help move the needle for some of the companies here? Uh, I would bucket them into five different categories, really. Uh, and it's all around the agent experience, the admin experience, and primarily the customer experience, um, seeing as that usually is what it all funnels down into. Um, 
including AI and machine learning, which the preferred partner is Visual Genius in that case. Um, there, there's a few other categories like uh, learning management uh, software, so you're able to train your agents, make sure they're up to date on all the information based on business challenges and stuff like that. Um, Lessonly is a great partner in that category. Um, we have, um, we've seen a lot of workforce management uh, questions come up recently. Um, we have a partner who essentially only exists on Zendesk and they have no interest in expanding anywhere else because that they, it feels like it's a Zendesk product and that's yeah. time shift. I'm pretty sure you, yeah, you I have some time experience shift, with yeah. them. Um, with a Y, right? Time shift with a Y. Yeah. Okay. Um, great guys, um, great products, love working with them. Um, another category would be uh, QA and performance. Um, so we have a few partners in that space. One that we work with the most at this point in time is Maestro QA. Um, they've got a great product, very simple to use, very easy to set up, but it contributes to the responses that you're providing back to your customers. Um, and then the last one would be uh, something that isn't normally affiliated with uh, customer service and customer service teams. Um, it's data synchronization, data integration. Um, so you have your customer service operations, but very frequently you have other departments that are communicating with through other software and stuff like that. Um, so automating a lot of the integration work that you have that you know could be either through Jira or through Slack or through Asana when you're trying to talk to product managers or project managers or finance, HR, whatever the use case is. Um, having those systems communicate with each other and automating all these processes where if someone dispositions a ticket, it pings you know people on Slack and does all these other things instead of manual effort that really saves a lot of time for the agents and it improves customer experience because it, it's less time for the customer to get a response. Um, so Azuka is our preferred partner in that space as well. So. Azuka, yeah. okay, good. So hopefully some of the folks in the audience are either already looking at those those products or um, remember the names, they could look into them. Sure. And for James and for Bree, um, what's one piece of advice that you'd like to share before we wrap up and open it up for questions with, with the folks in this room? So there's been a lot of really great discussion today, but what's like one general piece of advice that can pertain to machine learning if you if, it feels right, if not, just any general piece of advice. Um, I think what you mentioned earlier, there's like no silver bullet. Um, I would advise to like uh, stick with done over perfect. That's something that Magoosh really values is um, if something is ready, um, get it out there. Your customers will give you lots of feedback. Your agents will give you lots of feedback. Get it out there, iterate, um, and go from there. Um, yeah, I would say if it's within budget and uh, you know what you want to do, I'd say be very clear with how you're going to use or understand to yourself how you're, how you're going to use all that time that you've freed up. So, and what you want to do with your agents as well and how you want to develop them and being transparent. That's been the most helpful thing for me is, is building team morale and being transparent. With them. Was it hard to secure a budget for um, a machine learning tool in your business? Like, was it difficult to build a business case? Well, you were pretty early, so probably less proven case studies. James, for you, you had reference customers, but like, I'm just curious to know, because folks are probably looking into machine learning, and today at our booth, I heard a lot of questions about cost. How, like, is it cost prohibitive for my team? I know how it makes sense for an airline with 10,000 agents, but like, is it gonna work for my team of like 12? So, what about you guys? Um, it, it was not necessarily difficult for me, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, Again, I, 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 instead of wanting to cut costs, my, my intention was to keep costs relatively flat or like nominal um, while adding on new features. So it's like, okay, well, if we're, if we're email only, by the, end of, by the end of 18 months, we'll also have chat and SMS, and then hopefully by the end of 18 months, we can um, also have chat and SMS um, at the checkout page, try and, and help with conversion. So essentially, um, yeah, using that as our as our uh, case, I think was what it helped. Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, yeah, we did some like impact mod modeling, yeah. and we I don't know if y'all are still doing this, but we did like a trial period with y'all, and we just needed to see uh, the ROI, and we saw it within. We actually needed a little bit more time with y'all, but yeah. I mean that I think like being one of the first send us customers, right. like we just needed a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, I think it was. You know, like showing the numbers, showing the metrics, and um, and then having that time to kind of prove it. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you for those. So I, I promised to leave five minutes for um, questions and some maybe some discussions. So based on what you've heard, maybe if you have a burning questions about machine learning tools or any of these experiences, 
Like right now is the time we can all kind of openly discuss it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have two questions for, how do you pronounce your name? Mikhail. Mikhail. Yeah. Uh, first question, so, uh, you know, we use, we're starting to use Zen, well, we use Zendesk as our ticketing platform, and we're kind of tapping into some of those automated tools for the help site as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, are you planning on integrating more directly with chat client specifically? Mm -hmm. And is that is that on your roadmap? And if so, when? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So that's your first question, right? That's first question. Okay, so the, the, the quick answer is that today Digital Genius is available on all uh, text-based communication channels. So we started with um, email. So we do email support, we do web form-based support, we do chat, which is live chat, and then we do also um, asynchronous messaging. So anything from Facebook Messenger to WhatsApp, um, we're able to support that as well. And of course, social media, so Twitter, Facebook. We haven't done Snapchat yet, that'll be fun, but um, <laughs> it could be pretty creative, I think. Um, but yeah, we don't touch voice uh, at this point in time, but it is a roadmap item for us. So for us, if we're using live chat and, uh, you know, would, would that integrate with live chat, the, the app live chat? The, the, uh, the Zendesk chat? Or would no, it's a, the, the company itself is called live chat. Live chat. So I'm just wondering more about the integration side, I guess. For integrations, we either have pre-built apps. So if you're a Zendesk customer, we have an app for Zendesk. If you're a Salesforce customer, it's the same thing. If you're using a platform that um, we don't have already ready built out for, we have an SDK. And so we would just basically look at um, what, whatever platform you're using, and we would evaluate, and we'd basically see how long it would take us to just connect it to. But I'm pretty confident that it wouldn't be that hard at this point. And the reason I ask is, you know, you know, I would say maybe 50% of our, you know, password resets, for example, come, you know, 50% is email, 50% is chat. So if somebody were to chat in and say password reset, and we have this AI that yeah. links to our reset link on our backend system and sends it, and then the customer says that didn't work. Yeah. How do you integrate that within a live chat setting where it's like, okay, now we have to activate some like a live person to yeah. actually intervene with it? That's a great point. So um, I think you're touching on a really interesting thing where it's, it's we call it agent handoff. So at what point do you know that the machine learning algorithm did not perform or is not certain about its answer? And how does it seamlessly hand that off to the user? And for this, you know, platforms like Zendesk have made it really easy uh, through their APIs and our app where if, we, if our machine learning will perform its, its, its duty up until the point where the confidence level is below a certain threshold, and if it hits below a certain threshold, it'll just hand it off to an agent and provide a suggestion to the agent. So that you know the, the person in the trenches is never stuck with no recommendation, that they at least have a recommendation next to them. Cool. So that's the handoff process. Okay. And then second question, sorry, yeah. that was a long-winded question. No worries. Uh, so for us, like we use AWS for a lot of our services, mm -hmm. right? And if that goes down, our website is down, but we're still available to, yeah. to be there for the users. Uh, when it comes to ML and AI, mm -hmm. What sort of like data redundancy do you have on your side? So if something were to go down and our customer, you know, we've built and set up our business now to let AI and ML kind of take over. But if something were to happen where yeah, it takes it out. Don't have that automation. Yeah, what do we? What happens? What happens? So basically, uh, we also run on AWS. So I think like many of us in the room, we're kind of at the mercy of uh, <laughs> Mr. Bezos and their team. Thankfully, they, they've had some outages and it's it's been tough. Uh, for many companies out there, but I think um, that's one wild factor. In terms of redundancies, you know, we have, our, our servers are spread out geographically, so we have the ability to bounce things um, as needed in case of like emergency situations or downtime. But um, I, I think it's like a similar question of how, um, what would happen if electricity went out? <laughs> and so we would all have to kind of be safe. There'd be procedures in place, but as far as your team, the idea is that the AI is not there to make it so you don't have a team anymore. The AI is there to give your team the right tool to be more efficient. And so suddenly if the AI goes offline because AWS screwed up, well, thankfully your team is still there, but they don't have a calculator anymore to help them. So they might take longer, your backlog might grow. Um, but look at it the other way. Same thing happens during spikes. So if you have a spike and you don't have enough people, what are you gonna, are you just gonna hire like 10, 20, 30% more people overnight? KLM had this problem, they had an airport closing in Amsterdam, and they had a major spike in like, hey, my flight is canceled, what do I do? They were able to go to our dashboard, turn on automation for weather-related um, incidents, and every question that came in that was related to the weather closing got an immediate answer, basically explaining to the customer what they need to do to rebook based on this weather, inclement, inclement weather. Do you guys have spikes in your businesses, or it's not as common? We have seasonality. Seasonality. So yeah, I mean, we're getting into it, so. That's right. Yeah, same. Same. Yeah. Cool. Well, 
helpful. Yeah. Really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So like for that autopilot. Yeah. Uh, do the customers, if, you're, if they're getting like automated responses, yeah, do they know that it's like an automated response. Like, are, are they just like, oh, I'm working with a robot now? Yeah. So we make it very easy for the administrator of the tool to determine whether they want to um, inform the customer that they're getting automated responses or not. And so every customer chooses for themselves. And basically, with autopilot, if an answer is being sent automatically and a resolution is being done on, like, can you imagine yourself as a customer and you're asking like, I don't know, Netflix for a refund or, or some other company for a refund and like you get it 10 seconds later and it's a <laughs> refund and you're just like, what? Like this took, this should have taken like six weeks. Like, <laughs> what customer ever got their refund in 10 seconds? Like doesn't happen. And was unhappy about it. it right, right, right. Well, <laughs> so what we're, yeah, and was unhappy about it. Um, so in this case, yeah, it's really up to you. If you want to inform the customer that the answer is automated, it's just a little line of text saying, hey, this, an you know, this answer was automated. We want to provide you a fast service. Here it is. Yeah. To follow up on that, did you collect feedback from that? Like, yes. Definitely. So once again, there's two ways we collect feedback. The, the, the awesome one is with Zendesk because they have automated CSAT scoring for uh, customer support tickets. So we're just like blown away with these autopilot resolutions that are happening. And um, customers are coming back and they're writing in. They're saying, you know, I'm sorry. I, they're literally saying, I'm sorry I had to ask for a refund, but this customer service has been so fast, it, sh it will have me coming back next semester. It's, you've, you saw, I showed it to you just before the panel. It's really, it's really interesting how customers are reacting positively to these automated resolutions because nobody expects it. But provided, it's a good thing. Yes? So we're talking about a tool that is potentially ingested in some cases, like for Zendesk, there are millions of lines of customer and corporate communication, yeah. as well as with the automation has access to multiple backend systems. Yes. What were your strategies for security while building this? Yeah, so this was a huge thing for us. One of our first five customers was uh, HSBC, which is a global bank which has the tightest security policies. Uh, literally took us a year to pass their security uh, tests and <laughs> go through the process. But so that kind of uh, set us up for knowing what to expect from a very secure um, organization. And so today we have the certifications necessary to, to, to process this type of data. Um, you know, we're GDPR compliant um, and uh, have the things necessary to make sure we're, we're using the data appropriately. We don't store your PII or your customer's PII. That was also a very important thing. And uh, with the access to backend systems, we don't just tap into your backend system. We work with a person at your company who's responsible for the APIs into your backend system and make sure that when our, when our two systems are connected, they're built with like basically a redundancy plan on, or, or, or a safe security plan on your side as well as our side. And then, you know, for our enterprise size customers, we get, you know, these 20 page questionnaires uh, about, you know, all of the policies and procedures in place. How, how about you guys, you know, like any comments on the security, um, the automation, um, saying whether it's an automated answer or not, and the feedback. Any thoughts about those things? We haven't had any security issues that I know of, but regarding automation and whether or not people will know, one of the things that I've, I've requested that I hope will be will be available eventually is potentially putting a delay, mm -hmm. even like a ten a ten minute delay, yeah, on some of the responses like for refunds, yeah. So yeah, that's something that I would actually want to delay <clears throat> like five or ten minutes, so that so not ten second refunds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if it, so at least so if we're not going to tell them, maybe they will also I maybe mean, have you know the perception that yeah, you know, like if they well, get a refund like right away, then uh, well, I assume that it will spread to Reddit pretty quickly. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so that that was just something that off the top of my head that I think would maybe prevent people from picking up on that. Yeah, or, or being like having an adverse feeling about a, a super quick response. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's some things, right, we want, we want to get it immediately and some things where maybe we want to like put a little buffer in there. Yeah. Bree, you brought that up just before the panel. You yeah. said like having an artificial delay would be a maybe a nice feature to have. So you could yeah, I think like that. it is a question. And I would say, like I mentioned before, just like test it. Um, you will, again, you'll get like feedback from your customers. Um, and if you're seeing that they're not liking this automatic response, like you can change it. I think the biggest thing about the autopilot is unlike most of the kind of offerings out there, 
instead of just deflecting the customer with an FAQ article, which is kind of like building a barrier between you and your customer, because you're recycling an FAQ article that already didn't help them when they went to your website, and so they wrote you an email, and so you're deflecting with the same FAQ. It just doesn't make sense. This is all about resolution. It's using the AI model to understand the question, and then using that basically intent to execute that process and resolve the ticket to a solution rather than a FAQ. Cool, so I think that's about it. Uh, as far as time, um, we'll be around for, I guess, rest of this afternoon and evening. I think there's a party being hosted by Guru, so be sure to check that out, and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow at the Expo. Thank you for coming in.